Thank you for joining us, all those of you that are campus students and here today, and also we have students online, and we have an online moderator too, that will be you know, recording any questions that you might have. Okay. Uh, please put your hands together and help me welcome our panelists. We have Randy Baker, he's the course director for Composition and Visual Design in the Digital Cinematography degree. We have Dino Galina, who is the course director for Thesis 2 in the Film Production MFA. And we have Claude Osteen, he's the course director for Electronic Film Production in the Digital Cinematography degree. And Rob Scribner, who is the director of photography for Sky Tower Films and a graduate of the Full Sail Digital Cinematography degree.
people that are uh, the leads or your team are responsible for those elements. Um, you would want your visual effects artists working you know, on their workflow and your cinematographer working on their workflow and your director working on their workflow. But at the same time, merging those workflows and, and, and understanding what each other are doing um, so that those things can sort of braid themselves together uh, to make the project stronger. So, um, piggybacking off what you said, you know, not thinking through the whole process. You know, I think we often jump to the initiation stage. Uh, I often find that um, new filmmakers want to jump into production much quicker than maybe they should. Um, maybe we haven't thought all the way through. Maybe we haven't even thought about our music yet. Um, or our sound effects, or like you said, editing. Um, but in many cases, we haven't even thought about production, right? We've got to the script level, but have we really developed a visual style? Um, have we developed a, a music theme? You know, so I think there's a lot that we can do in pre-pro that we neglect. And of course, that's the cheapest time, right? I mean, it's easy to crumple up paper and come up with new ideas. It's much more difficult to come up with new ideas when you're got the money hose running. You know, you're renting your camera and your and your truck package and your uh, your your talent and your locations and all of that costs a lot of money. So it's better to work through your problems and your errors, I think, uh, early in the process. You know, in pre-pro. Exactly. I, I was a senior editor and I ran a post-production facility. And when we would start doing the budget, I would get together with the clients and ask them, "What are you expecting out of the edit?" Because sometimes you may shoot something that is not prepared for for when you get to the edit, like it should have been shot green screen, or I'm gonna do some 3D effects, or something like that, but get it all out in the open at the beginning. And this way you can plan for it, so you can plan those shots, and you know what's expected when you get to the edit. Especially a, a lot of your B-roll, because I don't know how many times I used to get on the phone with the, with the camera ops and say, guys, I noticed your shot list, and I didn't see any shots like this, and with the shots that you've given me, I'm gonna need some cutaways. And to get me out, you never wanna paint your editor into a corner. So you always wanna make sure that you have coverage of certain things. So, but going back to that, how can a workflow hinder a production? Clark? How can a workflow hinder? That's an interesting question. I guess it would depend on your workflow. I would think if you have a solid workflow, it would not hinder your production. If you have a workflow that is not well thought out, it would definitely hinder your production. I guess I don't understand the question completely. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a well thought out workflow, or you think it's well thought out. And then when you start going through it, you may have some little bumps in the road that you didn't expect. So an oversight. Say, for instance, you didn't understand that a film needs deliverables. You make a feature film, it's an excellent feature film, it exceeded all expectation, and then you take it to a film festival, it does really well, a guy named Weinstein comes up to you and says, I wanna pay $3 million for this film. Uh, you get excited, you're like, where do I sign? And he's like, not so fast, where are your deliverables? And then you say what? At this point, there's a potential that you are without luck, that you have to just simply throw away that project because you don't have the ability to even go back in time and get certain things that you have to have for your deliverables. So if you have an oversight, it could be completely detrimental. Exactly, because those things that you think you thought of you know, may crop up later and you're like, oh, well, that's kind of unexpected. I didn't even think about that. That's a good question and I don't have an answer to that because when you start running into the deliverables and you're looking at who's gonna be viewing this and you're not thinking about those things, and those can be the gotchas that could, like you said, stop a production or slow it down and or, and or cost you more money in the long end. Yeah, even to your profit. Right. You know, I've had those experiences distributors before where you get to um, the distribution phase and of course, um, distributors have connections as well. So if you don't have something done, well, they're happy to do it for you 
for a fee coming out of your profits. Um, and of course, that's always going to be uh, uh, a, a loftier fee than if you would have done it and, and planned for it before storing it. But that's, that's what they do. Right. Well, the old adage in, in production is good, fast, and cheap. Pick two. <laughs> so, and you run into that more times than you know than I can remember. It's it's always I need it tomorrow. Okay, I can do it tomorrow, but it's going to cost you this much. Uh, or I only have this much money. Well, okay, fine, I can do that, but it's, I can only go so far with this. So it, it's those things that you have to think of along the way, so you don't run into these things. And I'm not saying every production is perfect. I don't know of any production that I've been on that's been perfect. But it's how you handle the different situations, and it's knowing what your next step would be in case you run into a little gotcha along the way. And you do run into gotchas. How many gotchas have you guys run into?
and they were doing their big promotional piece about their line of books and everything. So they shot it, I get the footage, I start editing it, and then the producer looks at it and says, oh, I don't like the talent. I, the host of this, I don't like it. Could you cut around them? So they were the pivotal person in this whole piece, and now they're saying that they don't want that person in it, can I cut around it and do this? <laughs> so, yeah, I did, and it turned out to be one of the best products that they've ever had, and, and they were like, wow, you know, and which helped launch me at that time, because they gave me the idea, and boom, I just followed that path, and I was able to cut what they wanted, so. But you do get the little gotchas all the time in workflows. Like, like I said, nothing is ever perfect. If it is in this business, I would be amazed because something always happens in this business. I would love to chime in on this real quick. Too. So basically, you know, a year and a half ago, I was one of you guys. You know, I was in the seats or on the computer watching this. The biggest thing is that if I can give any piece of advice to this from, from your guys' perspective is that a plan for failure. Embrace it so much. Don't be afraid of it, but because you know it will go wrong. Something is just inevitably going to go wrong. And I know we hear it all the time, but it's so true. I just plan for that 20% just to, just chaos. And I think a part of, I don't know, at least this is the way I felt going, going into the industry, is I felt like you had to know everything. And the truth is you really don't. You need to actually admit that I don't know this. I don't know, uh, you know, a certain part of the process. I don't know what deliverable that um, and just own up to that don't be afraid you know that's the biggest thing is that you, you just need constant communication with everybody and I think that's part of the biggest just production pipeline uh, tip I could give well one of the biggest things I used to tell my students when I was teaching I was teaching an editing class and I would tell them I said one of the things you can do yourself a favor with is either at this time there wasn't a whole lot of it. people didn't use their cell phones all the time but I said, take a notebook with you. Nowadays, take your cell phone. If any time you run into someone that is that you see as an authority on something, get their information. You know, get to know them. This way, you have all these contacts. So when you run into an issue, say, sure, hang on, and you talk to that person. Say, look, I've never run into this issue before. Maybe it's with a camera or a light or with an editing system, something like that. You have that contact that you can talk to as that authority on that subject. And at that time, I had done a lot of different things for Abbott at the time. So I started getting calls all the time. So I said, oh, I got your name. I'm on this, I'm in an editing suite right now up in New York, and this happened. The machine crashed. They don't have support. Someone so told me that I can ask you a question. <laughs> And I didn't mind. I would be driving home sometimes and answering questions on the phone. So, okay, walk me through everything. What's going on? But it comes in handy. And in this business, this is all part of the networking. You get to know these people in the business. And if you have a good personality and a good work ethic, they're going to be happy to help you out. And that doesn't mean, it, you know, if, yes, a lot of people, you know, are vying for the same job sometimes. But you get to know these people. You become friends. Editors help other editors, camera ops help other camera ops, and vice versa. But knowing these people and networking is really going to help you in this business. And that's why one of the things that we push here all the time is networking. Get out and meet people and talk to people and get to know them because this will help you out. You know, coming from film school, you know, uh, the way that I was, I always thought of this, and actually I think I've heard from other instructors too, is that, you know, yeah, we're learning all this great information, but you, what you actually walk away with more important than anything is your network. That's actually why you're here, is everyone's really good at something, and you're not good at everything. So, you know, utilize that, you know, you know make friends. And I have that same thing where I get phone calls all the time, you know, especially since uh, since my, my uh, film Zion with Sony and the new uh, FS5. Everyone thinks I'm a genius at this camera now, but really I only had it for three days, but, you know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just uh, I, I know probably as much as they do, but you know the thing is, I have that impression, and of course, you know I do have a little bit more experience with this. I get phone calls and emails all the time, and I'm happy to help because that person might I might work with them some other day, and I might need their help too. And feel free to, if you don't know the answer, say, look, I haven't run into that, but I'll tell you what, let me have your information. I have a friend that I can ask and, and get you going. Just don't send out any misinformation. That's the biggest thing you never want to do because then 
people get to know that as well. They'll say, oh, don't call next one, so I tried them once, and they, did, they gave me this, and it didn't work. So I, I've been doing this a really long time, thousands and thousands of television shows, and uh, uh, people ask me questions. And I, I, the, the phrase that I like to say to people a lot is that I know enough to know there's a lot I don't know. And I learn something new every day. Trust me, in this business, there are a lot of know-it-all dumbasses. And so <laughs> you have to really, you know, it's really all about your reputation and, and knowing stuff. And there's people all around you uh, here, especially on campus. You have an incredible array of people that are telling the truth. And like in this room, Melissa Wolchecker, who's a gym operator, one of the best gym operators in handheld camera people in the business. Uh, I can't imagine the, she's probably done as many shows as I have. And her husband, Mark, is a, is a, fairly well-known VP, he was the VP on probably the first, I don't know how many uh, seasons of Survivor, he's done all the tribal counts and stuff as the VP for that, but there are people all around, the director who's directed this, I've known for years, and really an incredible guy, and uh, we've come up through the business together, so there are people everywhere, and don't be afraid to reach out to these people and talk to them, because there are resources that you can learn from, and you know, uh, I tell people, especially students all the time, Make sure you have business cards. If you're a student, there's no excuse for you not to have a business card. If you need somebody, hand them your business card and give their business card. And keep a database of everybody that you need because you never know when those people are. I, I can't tell you how many PAs I work with. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. I was on a, uh, last year, we were doing a show called uh, uh, My Family's Got Guts. It was a Nickelodeon show. And I was on a pre-production call with a bunch of people from Nickelodeon from New York. And they went through, oh, through their phone call and introduced people. And there was a name that I remembered. And um, she was the senior executive vice president for global worldwide production for Nickelodeon. So we got through the whole phone call. And uh, she, everybody hung up. And about five minutes later, I get a phone call. And it's this senior vice president of worldwide global production for Nickelodeon. She goes, thank you so much for not telling these guys that I was your craft service person when we first started out. So you just never know who that's, who that PA you're working with is going to be. So, oh, and, that, and that means treat everybody nice. You never know. A couple things to piggyback on that. One, yes, have a business card. And the best thing to do is if you're meeting someone at an event or something, write down where you met them at. And you hand it to them. So now, you know, they know, oh, wow, that was George Johnson. Oh, it was at the event of the Women in Film. Okay, now I remember I could place the card with a face and get you going. Another thing, too, is doing the research. How many people use the Internet to do research on questions? <laughs> Lots of you guys. Okay. Do you usually look for more than one response, or do you just say, wow, here's one. I need to know how to do this, and you see the first thing that pops up, and you start doing it. Or do you look and see if other people have done the same thing? Because one thing you don't want to do is, oh, wow, this person says, here's what you have to do, and you've got to do that. And then if you were to write down the comments, people are saying, oh, please do not do this. This guy does not know what he's talking about. It ruined my system and everything else. So make sure that you, when you do the research, if you find an answer, make see if anybody can back up that answer so you don't run into issues. Okay? Okay, One, another question I have is, how do you develop a workflow and how do you determine what's important in your workflow? Rob, you want to pick that one? Um, well, normally the first thing that I do when I, when I, someone says, okay, here's a project, the very first thing I ask uh, is, how is it going to be distributed? Is it going to be web? Is it going to be television? All these little factors. Um, that's where that's typically where I start, and then I kind of start working backwards from there. So then I start thinking about, okay, what's the music going to sound like? What's the, you know, what's what's the the image going to look like? You know, the uh, the mood and all that stuff. Um, and then from there, I can start delegating my my tasks properly and getting the right people for the right job. Um, that's what I personally do. Um, one thing I have learned is that when you're the process used for your previous film or commercial doesn't typically work for the next one. Each one is unique in its own way, and it, it, no matter how many times you've done it, even if it feels like the same thing, there's, it's not going to be the same workflow. Um, I, I guess that's, that's pretty much the way I go about it. All right, one thing to tag on to that is 
knowing how it's going to be distributed. I, I, I know everyone on this table probably runs this. First, it started out with like the red. Everybody hears it, it shot on red. I want to shoot it on red. What are you going to do? How's it going to be distributed? Oh, it's going on the web. Well, right, why yeah. do you want to shoot it on the red? Oh, because the red, oh, it's the best one out there. Da, 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 da. They're not thinking. They don't know, you know, what the workflow is or anything else. Same thing. I have to shoot it on 4K. Why do you want to shoot it on 4K? Because everybody's shooting on 4K. Don't you know? You have to shoot this on 4K. I'm putting it on the web. I'm like, oh, okay. Sometimes you do have to educate your client because clients hear buzzwords all the time. They hear 4K. They hear red. They hear all these things. And they're like, got to do that because that's what everybody's doing. But sometimes it is just sitting down with them and saying, okay, well, I can do that. But that goes back to that good, fast, and cheap. So, okay, your workflow, it's going to take a little bit longer because I have to transcode all this. Or I have to convert, you know, this into this. And if I'm going to develop assets, they're going to take longer time to render, things like that. And it's so it's going to cost you because time is money in this business. So part of that is just educating them on what is expected if you choose that path in your workflow. And there really is so much to know. I, it, there's a great book by a guy named Blair Brown called Digital Superpowers. And, and it, and the book is like a seminal book in terms of the new way of shooting stuff. But one of the things that he really discusses in this book, which is really important, is all the decisions you have to make about just the production side of, of what you're doing. For instance, just a little shoot like this. I mean, we've got a slider up here, we've got two cameras on sticks, we've got a handheld camera, we've got a gym camera. Uh, there's a GoPro, there's a 360 camera we're playing around here. So all of a sudden you start looking at all those different things about, okay, what camera am I going to use? And for us, it's, it used to change. When I first started out in the business, it was like, okay, are you going to shoot on an Aton or an Air 8? You know? uh, now it's like, okay, what are you going to shoot on? Are you going to shoot on a Red? Are you going to shoot on Alexa? Are you going to shoot on a Phantom, or you're going to shoot on a Sony, or you're going to shoot, I mean, there's so many choices of cameras, and then you have all kinds of lenses, what format are you going to shoot, 16 by 9 anamorphic, 2 by 3 5 I mean, there's so many things, and then you start looking at, are you shooting 6K, 4K, 2.7K, 2K, 1080, 720, uh, you shoot 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, off speed at 48, super slow, one twenty or 240, what codec are you going to do, are you going to go 30 megabits a second, 50 megabits a second, megabits a second. And then you have things like, am I going to use a slider? Am I going to use a Mobi? Am I going to use a Steadicam? I could, so it goes on and on and on. Uh, and so if you don't have a workflow in place where you can actually go through and say, okay, here's exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to do it, it kind of gets to be overwhelming and uh, you kind of lose your place. And so how many of you have heard about the five P's of production? Anybody? Prior planning prevents production problems. And so that's really good. And there's an old saying in our industry, great post-production begins with great pre-production. So you have to really look at you know, workflows as a way to really get your act together and know what you're doing. And, and once you, I tell my students all this, this all the time, because I get students who are coming in, they're 10 months into our course, they get their camera package two days before my course starts. And right away they jump right in the very first week where they have deliverables that they have to deliver. And by the third week they're actually shooting and editing the 60 second video with 14 different shot types. And for somebody who's been around production and shot before, it's not too bad, but I have a lot of students who have never picked up a camera before. So it begins to be overwhelming. So what I try to teach them is start developing a workflow early on for how you're doing it. And you know, one of the biggest things that you can learn in this business is that if you're just looking at a basic workflow, 50% of your time should be spent on pre-production and planning, 25% should be spent on production, and 25% should be spent on post-production. If you do the 50% of pre-production, which is the cheapest part and the easiest part and the hardest part to do, uh, then when you get into that 25% of production, it will go much easier production goes much easier, your post is going to go much easier. So you've got to really develop a workflow. And, and it's like Dino was saying, there's different workflows. If you're a one-man band, if you're doing a music video, if you're doing an indie film or a low-budget film, if you're doing a big feature film, if you're doing a television show, 
every workflow is different. So you've got to be able to kind of look at the whole bigger picture and break it down into a set of thought workflows, get the workflow needs. And for you guys as students, it's really important that you start developing workflows as you go along that are kind of geared towards your own perspective of filmmaking and what you want to do. Because it's different for everybody. And all, all of us have different workflows. If you ask us to lay out our workflows, you can see we all have different styles and different ways that we like to approach things. But if you have your act together and do the right amount of pre-production, have the workflow down, if you have problems, not if, when you have problems that arise on the set, you'll be able to flow with that and change uh, direction or change gear. Plus, it will also, uh, if you're not worried about, okay, what am I doing next, what am I have to do? And if magic happens on the set, then you're able to capture that magic. I've seen, been on sets where it's been total chaos and these incredible things are happening, but they don't, they're not able to capture it because they're so worried about just trying to figure out what they're doing. So it's really important to really have your act together. I'd like to piggyback on what Randy was saying about all those technical aspects that he sort of ran through. It can be sort of intimidating, but what I have come to notice, people who talk about the technical aspects, and they're talking about it at length and a little bit too much, it's usually always coming out of insecurity. And I'm not saying that's you at all, but like, it does, it comes like, out of insecurity because they haven't done the 50% of the pre prospecting. And that's the most important part. There's like those, you were also saying there's critical aspects and then non-critical. Tax, critical tasks and non-critical tasks. Well, it's like, it comes back down to an ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of effort, effort. But in this case, in filmmaking, like you were saying, once you get you know the jig that you're renting, the camera you're renting, and you've got the drip truck that you're renting, and not to mention all the human resources that are, you know, the money when you turn on that spigot, it starts flowing and it flows fast, and it's it can get very overwhelming very quickly, and that's not the time to be doing pre pro. Like you'll see a lot of the time that's when a lot of pre pro is done is in production because they're sitting on set, and it's like that old adage, like, it's a bad joke, but how many students don't make, uh, filmmakers does it take to change the light bulb? I don't know, what do you think? Yep, because that's what you hear out of most directors. They come up and they're just like, I don't know, what do you think, that is just pretty, you know? And that's what you get, and it's because they didn't take that time in pre-production. And you can do amazing, amazing things with visual. So what I like to do a lot of the times is I'll give my students a one sentence scenario. And it's something like a out of towner comes into a cafe and there's like a, a female doctor and they're perfect for each other. And I'll write the shot list. And I'll give them 30 minutes and then I'll even let them like talk about it amongst themselves and like go through and try to like really streamline it to get to exactly what they need. And it ends up being like 30, 40 shots. And it's always like, you know, we start off on a super wide, establish a shot of a cafe, we punch to a, a medium, as we see an out of counter walking with a suitcase, cut to a close up of the doorknob as he opens it, you see the bell on the door, another shot there. Then, um, right as he walks in, he almost is a waitress, and now we're on a cracking shot on this plate of bacon as we sort of establish the restaurant in this really incredible, you know, steady cam shot. And then we cut to a doctor sitting there. And it just becomes this really long thing. And then I'll say, well, what if we just had one shot? Just one. We're at the corner of a counter, and we see a female doctor walk in. Maybe she's going on a special or something. And we see a guy sitting at the other side with a suitcase next to him. And they don't notice each other. They don't notice each other at all. And then the guy comes and pours some coffee for him. And at the same time, they both grab the milk with their right hand and pour it, not noticing. Then they grab with their left hand the sugar, they pour the same amount, and they use their right hand and stir it. And it's almost choreographed perfectly, but neither one noticed. And you haven't even seen their faces. You're just seeing it from behind as they're sitting there, and you're just here. What do you know? You know, the audience is automatically feeling that these two people should meet. 
think maybe they're perfect for each other. It's just in their head. The audience feels that because they witnessed it. Now, if you have two people sitting at a diner, then they're having a conversation talking about how, oh, you like your coffee that way too, and then you have all these other superfluous shots going on, that is a lot of time and money, and it's a lot of workflows going on there. You have to hire a steady cam operator, you have to make sure you have the right equipment to pull that shot off, you have to have all these other extras, which is just a logistics nightmare. And then you don't know what could happen in that cafe when you get there that day. You know, there's just so many things that could possibly go wrong. But if you know, because you've done your pre-pro, and you've simplified it, and you know the exact beat you're trying to pull off, and you know the exact visual equivalent of what it is when two people that are perfect for each other meet, and you have it in your head, and you know, as a director, when you get there, the six go here, this is the shot, this is the lens I want, it just makes the whole workflow process a lot easier. And it's that little ounce of prevention, which is just taking the time when it's cheap. Like he said, it's easy to just crumble up a new paper or a script and throw it away and start a new one. But when you're on set, you can't be sitting there talking with your cinematographer trying to figure out how we're going to cover this. And you know, you've also said that they like to go out there prematurely. And then you end up getting, which is another form of insecurity, which is we're just going to shoot the mess out of everything. We're going to shoot every possible angle with every possible gadget. That way we know we have it in post. But guess what? You probably won't have it in post because it wasn't well thought out. I've seen people go out and shoot hundreds of hours worth of footage, get back, and yeah, they have almost every conceivable angle, but they don't have the lens or shot they actually needed because they didn't actually envision it. So then they have to go back out and do a reshoot, which is fundamentally more expensive than just having done it in the draft phase. So your workflow does have very, very, very critical points. But like Randy was saying, that first 50%, that pre-production is huge. And you cannot underestimate it in any way. Just a couple things about the clock that takes off. Did anybody recognize that scene he talked about? Second thing is Gordon Willis. Everybody knows Gordon Willis is a shot spotter, buck shot spotter, incredible. Uh, and cinematographer, my favorite cinematographer, as a matter of fact. He calls that kind of where you go out and do massive coverage, he calls it dump truck shooting, where you just shoot a ton of stuff and dump it in the back of the truck and then come and unload all of that on the amateur and so forth. So that here's a transition for you. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna brag a little Can I say yeah. one quick thing about that? When you do the dump truck method, Guess who becomes the director? The editor. Every time. So don't give up your direction. Don't give up your vision. You don't have to have it. Yeah. I'm just, this is a good transition. I'm just going to brag a little bit here. Uh, if you don't know, Rob just last year won the uh, American Film Institute Gordon Willis Award for Best Documentary Film Role. Don't be his role.
we got on set, we started shooting. On the second day, my executive producer came to me and goes, hey, Rob, this is going way too smooth. Like, what's wrong? This doesn't seem right, you know? And it's because the, pre the previous people, you know, it's just they're doing the dump truck method where everything was just chaos and we get a toast and everyone's fighting about the way she look and feel. And it, it came down to, you know, once we got a toast, just follow the, the, the storyboard and boom, there we had it, you know? And the fact that they were so unorganized that they, they kept going back and trying to do revisions. And at, at the end, Dan's going to the original one, going, this was, this was right the first time. And it felt really, really good to do that. So I felt, this is what needs to happen every single time. Is I need to have that, that uh, you know, producer, director, or anyone come up and say, what the hell's going on? This is too smooth, you know? So I took that approach with Warbird Pilot and I thought about the end result first. And I very, uh, I'm pretty sure they do that in your, uh, was it the uh, portfolio? I can't remember the name of it, but the very first one, they say, uh, in one of the classes they mentioned, like, what is your goal? That should be the, the starting point. My goal was to get a Vimeo staff pick. And uh, I wasn't looking to get into film festivals or anything like that because I knew that what would probably skyrocket my career is getting my name known out there through the internet. You know, so Vimeo is a very good way to do that. So that's what I thought about. So auto automatically, I already know I'm shooting for the web. So then I started breaking it down. And then my next thing was like, what do I want to feel like? What kind of emotional storytelling do I want to go about? So I went, I found some music that was really inspirational to me. And then I actually started talking to another audio guy, kind of told my idea and said, I would like to make a custom score because I can't find exactly what I'm looking for. So he went and put like a little sample together and said, this is perfect. So the very end song that you watched actually made by a good buddy of mine named Mark Del Bay. And I actually would take that, put my headphones on, and I would listen to that over and over and over. And I'd visualize the entire film and start drawing out every shot, writing down every shot. And then before you know it, I have this whole, like, I know exactly what I need to do. So then that way I can miss tiny revisions after that. You know, so I know that, okay, I am gonna need a steady cam for this shot. I'm gonna need, uh, I know I'm doing aerial stuff, so, you know, that means I'm gonna have to have a very small compact camera. How am I gonna do that? You know, I even I even had it figured out, like, I wanna get these overhead shots. Well, how am I gonna do that? Well, you know, I attached a new handle onto the FS100, flipped it upside down, and I actually shot in uh, Sony's action magazine of me actually doing that same exact thing. And I had all that planned out. I knew exactly what I needed. Um, so yeah, I mean, that was pretty much my, my workflow. It started at the end and worked backwards, just like I mentioned before. But I think, you know, just knowing that you were in the goal is what really made it successful. Interesting that you wanted to be a Vimeo staff pick. Yes. Yeah. the first time I've ever heard anybody say that. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's, and that's, and that's the same brilliant. response I actually got from one of the instructors. I can't remember who it was, but wow, that's, uh, most people are like, oh, I want to get into a film festival or something like that. And then, I don't know, just from my experience, that seemed like that's that's a shot in the dark, you know? So, but, you know, getting a Vimeo staff pick, I know that I actually saw some of the in inspiration from, you know, that type of content online. And then the moment I got it, and I just knew I was, because I just poured my heart into this film. And uh, I, I, did, I was actually uh, talking to him, and it's not a matter of if I get it, it's a matter of when I get it. And then sure enough, literally right then, my phone bus and said, congratulations, you already got a Vimeo staff pick. And then after that, I had like, 250,000 views in like three days, tons of likes, and then suddenly I'm getting phone calls uh, from Sony saying, hey, we just, this is this is great, and then, you know, it's like, this is exactly what I wanted, I got noticed, and here I am now, so. Well, the camera that he got from YouTube was from the time. That's right. Oh, that's right. FS100. So, we're now at, up to the FS100 at this point, we're introducing the new FS5, George. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the, the one we just worked with, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, going back to the, the dump truck method. So part of my workflow as, as an editor is I start from the beginning, and I would be talking to the producer and the director about exactly what feel they wanted from the story. So when I did have them get the dump truck method, I had an idea of exactly what they wanted, and I could start working through that footage. Now, granted, you're always dealing with a time issue and budget issue. So there's a lot of things you just don't have time to go through, and it's, it's nice that they give you a lot of footage, but then it means you know, it's gonna take hours and hours and hours to weed through a lot of this, so you're looking for the best of the best, and a lot of times you may have to skim through footage, and you're looking for what the feel was that they said that they wanted this piece to be. 
So it's going through that footage and finding those pieces and putting them together. And you're trying to get it done in the time allotment that you have. And you know, a lot of times it will work out work out well. Sometimes you may have to ask for extra time. But that is kind of one of those gotchas in a workflow when they do give you that dump truck. Hey, we just shot everything. Uh, so put it together. And a lot of times you may be dealing with, uh, I've, at least I've dealt with a producer before, where they didn't know exactly how they wanted the story to go. So you're building it. And then they're making decisions along the way. Like, it's trial and error. It's like, yeah, let's go in a different direction. Yeah, let's go in a different direction. Because they're trying to figure out with their client, some of these were corporate pieces, so they're trying to figure out with the client exactly what they wanted. So you're kind of the guinea pig, and you're going back and forth trying to make adjustments for it instead of just saying, this is the direction that we want to go. Sometimes they may not have a clear direction, and you're having to pull that out of them. And that's what your job is, too. So you got to look at where you are and why you were hired on these different pieces. So let's talk a little bit about threading between stages. You go from the pre-production, then you're going into production, then you're going into post. So let's talk about the transition and staying on a workflow. Anybody want to grab that one? Well, there's lots of, lots of different things. I mean, if you follow some of the young new filmmakers, go back and kind of look at their early films and stuff, and if you can see any of the behind the scenes stuff, you'll see that they actually do things like they take a little video camera and actually take the camera out, and they will go out and actually shoot the entire scene with that camera before they do it, because they'll have people standing there and stuff. And then they'll go back and edit that, and they'll look at the scene and the pacing and stuff before they even think about taking the film scene, which is just during pre-production that they take the shots and stuff. So it's, it's really kind of one of those things that the more you do of that type of stuff, uh, I, I mentor a couple of high school students, and uh, I have a 16-year-old who works high school, and she came to me uh, last year and said, I want to do a feature film. I was like, ooh, Dale, let's start with the short film first. So uh, and she planned the whole thing out, but I made her actually go out and shoot the entire, it was a three-day shoot, but I made her go out during pre-production and shoot the entire film with a little DSLR, and then come back and she edits it into things before it was just me standing there and different people standing there. And it was with a lot of actors and animals and horses and stuff. And uh, she came back to me after she did that. And she she fished about it the entire time. I mean, she was like, why am I having to do this? But when she got it done and edited it, she said it changed the entire way I felt about this film and how I looked at the film. And when we went back out and shot those three days, we were done early every day. She knew exactly what, and this, she's a 16-year-old. And she was directing talent uh, on, on the set. And it was, it was some pretty complicated gyms and sliders and all kinds of stuff. But she knew exactly what she wanted to be shot. And that's the whole key. I say this all the time to people. 90% of directing is knowing what you want. The other 10% is being able to effectively communicate that to other people. That's what she said. And, and I think the process, you know, it, sometimes you make it sound so mysterious. I found this shot and, and you know it all works out and it's beautiful and how is that person inspired and how do they come up with it? It's working through it. There's no magic. You know, it, you're not taking an SAT. You can cheat, right? You can go ahead. You can you can do your animatic. You can work it out. You can figure out what doesn't work. And then once you get there, you have the right ammunition to make the right decision. And then you do have a vision. You know, like you're saying, you think from what is my end goal? And, and you can look at that in so many different ways. You know, I, I tell a lot of my students all the time, the production process specifically should be as easy as those old paint by numbers books. You know, all of our work should have been done early on, where we drew out all of our lines, we decided what colors go into what little blocks, and once we get to production, it's just pulling out the crayons or the paints and, and filling it in, you know? And, you know, the only thing I think you could really say to, to argue having a good workflow is the whole, you know, what a lot of my students, you know, sort of lean back on at times is, well, you know, I want to improvise and I don't want it to be organic. And, you know, that's fine, but I believe and I truly do believe you plan for improvisation. You know, you don't just show up and do it. Um, it reminds me of a quote that Frank Zappa had said, you know, he doesn't just come up with stuff off the top of his head. He works through structure so strongly as a jazz artist that he gets himself to a place where he frees himself in that structure. So don't look at workflow as being this, this 
rigid structure, um, but yet as a tool for you to know and be able to make decisions on, this is, this is what I want to get out of my project. Now, if you have those moments on set where the light's just right or the actor does something that inspires you or your DP brings an idea to you, you plan so well that you're able to take advantage of those moments. You know, and I think you had brought that up earlier. Um, so, yeah, and there's really no reason not to have a good workflow. And in addition to that, I think all of these things that we're talking about, it, it's writing is rewriting, right? So as you're going through your workflow, you're not necessarily going to get it perfect or, you know, you're going to be going through it, developing it, and deciding, you know what? I've got this endpoint, now some things don't work. You may need to go back and rework it. Yes, it does take effort. You may have to throw some of your work away, but that's okay. You know, I always think we make a film five or six times in pre-pro, if not more, right? And then end up getting one track that actually works out for us. But we plan all of these different possible tracks that we could have taken to get to that end result. Right. You have to have a structure and outline. That doesn't mean it's, it's set in concrete because you have to learn to adapt to the circumstances as you go. And that's where a good workflow comes in because you can make adaptions. Because if something starts to steer it the wrong way, you just bring it back in on course. But having that structure in place, that outline, it keeps you on that path. I would love to chime in on that again too. So actually talking about Warbird Pilot, uh, that, that same exact thing happened. So originally it wasn't called Warbird Pilot. It was actually called uh, How to Create a Soul. And it was about a, it was about a Warhawk Museum actually. And then we actually, in the first PMA class, I believe it was, shot a little bit of footage uh, for it, and then I had to kind of throw on hold uh, for, you know, till the next class or so. Um, in between that time, you know, I had all this pre-production planned out, everything was great, um, and then all of a sudden, um, we didn't have access to the museum. The whole direction of the whole project was just shot. But, you know, because I had planned it so well, I was able to actually adapt it and still actually keep all my work the same, and then actually, just instead of being about a huge museum, we just made it about an individual instead. And there's actually several in the book that doesn't make it the full cut. But you know, it, it, it was it made it super easy to just transfer around. You know, and uh, um, the the mood and everything, everything that you saw in there was exactly what was supposed to be in the museum piece. All right, let's take um, let's take a look at the future of workflows. Nowadays, we have the cloud platforms, private clouds, hybrid clouds, things like that. How do you see that influencing workflow? You, you can see the change already. It's, it's, it's really more for uh, collaborative uh, filmmakers and just becoming a new strain in filmmaking. It's always been around. I mean, you always need to surround yourself with really good people, but now you can do that with different platforms, different things. So you've got the, the new company called Frame.io, which is using this really nice They, they were production people who just got frustrated about uh, not being able to collaborate with the right people who were in the industry. So they kind of went into necessity developing software and it's become a, a big thing. But you know, there's private clouds and there's uh, public clouds and there are hybrid clouds. And um, you're going to see that become a, a bigger and bigger way of doing production. So imagine if you're a young filmmaker and uh, uh, again, there are thousands of thousands
Well, you're also seeing that in some of the editing systems as well, where you can edit in different locations, and people don't have to be with you because you're broadcasting to them in essence, so they can see everything, and you can communicate in real time. And so they don't have to, you're saving that cost on travel, and also, you can do it at any time. You say, well, let's do it now, let's do it tonight, at midnight, whatever. Whatever's convenient for you, I'm gonna be working on the edit, I want you on the other end, so you can see what I'm working on, you can see my shot list, and you can, you know what, I'm looking through it, I'll go take a look at clip number seven, and I've already marked some places for you, because in some of these systems, you can actually mark your in and out as a producer, and say, take a look at this, let's put it in about right, right in here, let's, let's see how that works. So that increases your workflow on the edit process and in post-production, it really saves you a lot of time and like I said, the, the travel time and money. A lot of the television shows that I worked on, the network designs the show running around the New York. The production is usually done wherever we did the production and the post is done a lot of times in LA. So you have three different areas of people working together and as soon as we shoot something, it's either uploaded to the cloud or it's sent back to FedEx and so there's this constant communication that goes on between the network and the showrunner and the production and the post-production. So they're always talking to each other and it's, it's really amazing that how fast it's become. So we shoot something one day, it goes to LA that night, the next morning it's like getting dailies almost. I get reports back as a VP from the editor saying, okay, this is working or we're having a problem here, we need to change it up or we need to do a pickup. So it's not anymore where it used to be like we finished the project we need to go do pickups. Now it's like the very next day we're doing pickups for the stuff that's actually made as well, which really just streamlines the whole process. Exactly, exactly. And then, like I said, we're in the future, so embrace it. And this is just like your online program. That's why we're pushing the go-tos and everything else to get you involved, because we want to get you prepared so when you get out there, you're not, you know, like, whoa, what do you mean you want to connect on the internet? Uh, I don't want to be in front of the camera. I don't want to do this. And, no, that's the way of the future because it is a lot faster, connections are quicker, and it saves money. So they just want the, the idea right then. They want to see the you know the look on your face. That's why you do one-on-ones. You don't want to sit there. If you're if I'm having a conversation about the project and I want to see how it's going, I want to see what your face is going like, eh, eh, it's going okay. You know, like, oh crap, what's going on? I can I can tell in your voice, I can see on your face that there's a problem. Instead of like an email, oh yeah, it's going fine. Da, da, da. I have a really good story that about something that just recently happened where uh, online c collaboration really saved us a ton of time. Uh, we were shooting a commercial and we were about three days in and we're sending dailies out. And then like the next day we had feedback. Well, it was an oversight, but luckily it was caught at the right time that, you know, uh, since we sent those dailies out, we had instant feedback. And they, they basically came back and said, oh, well, this isn't your fault. We, uh, we sent you the wrong product. And, you know, and if it wasn't for that, you know, we would have shot the whole thing already been in post editing, and they would have came back and said, "Oh crap, now we need to redo this." In that meantime, what would have happened is we would have tore down an entire set we built in our soundstage, and it would have costed us thousands of dollars to res reshoot it all. Luckily, they were able to overnight the correct part to us, and we were able to pick up right where we left off. Still cost money, but not as much money. Right. And if it wasn't for that online collaboration, basically, they would have been screwed. We probably would have been too. Right. Well, at this time, we want to hear from you. So we're going to take a couple minutes, and we want to have your questions. So if you have a question for one of the panelists, just raise your hand, and someone's going to bring a microphone to you. For those of us joining us online, please direct your questions to the online moderator, and we'll try to accommodate your questions as well. So who has any questions? All right, we have some questions up front, so let's get a mic down here. Yeah, absolutely. The, the passion that you have for this. Yep, yep. And I did, 
didn't know a lot about it, which made, made it easier, but it also let me know that there was a, a good story to tell. But really what it comes down to is you just need, if, if, if I had to say what, what do you need to know, is just understand the basics. You don't need to be an expert, but you, there are, like, you do need to understand the, the fundamentals of, you know, what are stingers, you know, what are, what are, what are sticks, you know, what kind of, what is a certain codec, what does it do, uh, you know, what, what type of distribution is out there. I mean, that's like the basics. You don't have to be the best at it, but, I mean, those, those are really important factors that are going to allow you to, you know, uh, make the right decisions uh, through the whole work, you know, through the whole pipeline. Right, you're going to develop a certain skill. Let's say you're great at camera, but as you go through your programs, you're going to learn a little bit about lighting, directing, editing, things like that. And that gives you a skill set to be able to talk to these other people. So it gives you that background of information where it's like, okay, I'm going to go out and shoot this. Now I need someone to run audio for me or edit it. So now you, you have that basic knowledge where you can talk to them on the same level. They may have that skill set, but you have that information to relay what you want done. Also, too, it depends on your role. Like you were saying, if you're a director and you're doing a narrative film, you really need to know your story. You need to know what it is you're trying to say. Um, that can even affect workflow in unusual ways. Like I've heard people say that, like in the script writing process, that you should develop a character first and then sort of see how that character would interact if this happened or this happened. And I didn't understand that. I was like, well, what if your character goes someplace where you don't want it to go? Like, what if I just created a list of all these interesting character traits or whatever, and my character ends up doing something that I don't have any interest in or it's not a story I want to tell? So there, you're starting at your end, which is, this is what I want to say. But then you can also run into the opposite issue of character is, am I just going to come up with sort of a cliche character that's going to fit the mold for this entry? So everybody's workflow is going to be different, but my personal opinion is, is you need to know what it is you want to say as a director, as a filmmaker. You don't make these films just to sit in a dark room and watch it yourself. You're sending it out to an audience, and that has a grave responsibility. Figuring out who you are as a director and what it is you want to say. I think there's a really amazing movie called Sullivan's Travel. It's not Skeletal, but Sullivan's Travel. Have y'all seen that? No? It's an older film, it's black and white, but it's about a director on a discovery of why he's a filmmaker. And it's <coughs> quite a fascinating film. If you just get a chance to see it, please see it. But uh, as far as getting to know everything about your story, you know, when you start off making a, a, a film, it's a very, very complex problem. And the first solution to a complex problem is always a very complex solution. And the genius lies in being able to strip it down and simplify, simplify, simplify. It's like Steve Jobs figuring out how to do a, a gadget with one button as opposed to just having every possible button you could possibly hit. So it's starting off with this complex idea and stripping it down to a very simple solution that way, when you get to set, and you do get to start collaborating with people, and they're throwing all these ideas at you, and trust me, a lot of people are going to give you a lot of ideas on set, and you're going to need to filter between good ideas and bad ideas. The more you know about your film, the more you know about what it is you're trying to say, the more you'll be able to evaluate what's coming at you. If you don't really know your story, you don't really know why you're out there, or why you're doing what you're doing, you're going to be a wind song. Whichever way that wind is blowing, you're not seeing it on set. When the director will sit there and just nod at like the cinematographer, and then the producer will whisper something, and then they'll nod. And it's like, you know, you're the person with the direction. You're the person making the decision. You can't just be a windsock. And if you don't do your brief if you don't do that 50%, you're going to be a windsock. We have a question right up here. Let, let me just follow up real fast, though. But really, what you're wanting to do is develop a broad base understanding of, of what you want to do with the, with, with the film. You know, I teach visual language uh, to people, and, and people who are starting out just, they just don't quite understand it. And I explain it much like you don't need any kind of broad language. You have to learn that language. And when you first start out, you're going to stumble over syntaxes and wording and the way you, you, you say things. But as you practice that more and more, so you need this broad base to start with. And 
And then you need to kind of hold in on what you really want to do and really become kind of the expert at that. So the, the most amazing thing about this industry for me is that you're constantly learning. It's a lifetime of learning. So don't think that you're going to have a blank record on everything. You know, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I'm still blown away every day because I learn something that is terrible every day that I didn't know before. So to me, that's the most exciting part of it. It's just learning and learning and learning and learning. And so you just have to be open up to that. You can't kind of close down and say, I'm an expert at this, and you know, you can't tell me what I need to know. So you surround yourself with really good people. And that's uh, what we talked about earlier about making contacts. Now at this stage, you need to start developing teams of people that you feel comfortable working with and getting people together to work with you. So you don't need to know everything, but you need to know enough to be able to communicate effectively with everybody that you're working with. Right, so that's one of the biggest things in college is you're learning how to learn. So once you stop learning in this business, it's when you go by the wayside. You always have to stay current. Like, uh, just piggyback on that, the fact that it's just good communication up front. Uh, 
Um, you just you got to be super transparent, and that's not very cliche, but it's really true. Um, you know, when I I, I was used to uh, working with pretty big crews where we had three camera operators, sometimes four, uh, when on those DD comp shoots. Um, before I showed up, they used to have this problem where uh, say, okay, I want you to be, you know, I want you to film on this side, I want you to do this. But the problem is everybody was shooting medium close ups, so you get a post. And there, there, there's no wides, there's no close-ups, all those type of things. And, and, you know, that's one thing I learned from going to wholesale here was that, you know, is good communication goes a long way. So when I stepped in, took, took over, you know, everyone, ha I made it very clear at the beginning uh, when we go through our creative briefs, you know, heading into production, your job is to specifically get close-ups. And uh, or your job is to get just the wide shot. I don't want you doing anything else. This is your role. And then on top of that, you know, if, it, if it's just a small crew, like, you know, where we have one camera uh, shooting a commercial on a red or something like that, then it would be like, okay, your job is solely to deal with the lenses. That's it, period. Don't even ask about anything else because I have someone else. Is, you know, just make it super, super clear. Um, and, you know, they, they were at that time, they were really used to just kind of like, whoever well, just does what they want to do, you just shoot what you want. And I one guy going, it's like, there's, there's so many people doing other things going on right now because I had a multitasking. That is like, I, I don't know what's going on. It's like, well, it's not your job to. That's my job. Your job is to actually shoot this particular subject at this particular frame. And, uh, you know, once once we established that, for the next two years, everything was super smooth. We have enough time for one quick question. Let me just follow up real fast, real fast. Um, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But there's a, uh, my wife and I were just watching the new James Bond movie the other day. And if you watch the beginning of that movie, there's about 20 executives. She actually said to me, what are all those people doing? I go, they're the running people. And if you if you see it, there's a great movie called State Maine about the movie making. It's really funny. But there's a running gag in that about just trying to get money for people. And every time somebody they, they pitch somebody for money, they go, well, what do we get out of it? You know, we give you an executive producer time. So it's it's kind of a running gag. Uh, in terms of first AD and second AD, there's a great book called The Film Director's Team, and it outlines in great detail Indie and uh, fully feature. Okay. Well, I'm gonna have to close for today. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much uh, for attending today, and with I'd like to thank our guest, Randy.